First of all, a soul is not something that you have. It is what you are. I usually use the term entity in preference to the term soul simply because those particular misconceptions are not so connected with the word entity and its connotations are less religious in an organizational sense. The trouble is, you frequently consider the soul or entity as a finished, static thing that belongs to you, but is not you. The soul or entity, in other words, your most intimate, powerful inner identity is and must be forever changing. It is not therefore something like a cherished heirloom. It is alive, responsive, curious. It forms the flesh and the world that you know. And it is in a state of becoming. Now, in the three-dimensional reality in which your ego has its main focus, becoming presupposes arrival or a destination, an ending to that which has been in a state of becoming. But the solar entity has its existence basically in other dimensions. And in these, fulfillment is not dependent upon arrivals at any points, spiritual or otherwise. The soul or entity is always in a state of flux or learning and of developments that have to do with subjective experience rather than with time or space. This is not nearly as mysterious as it might sound. Each of my readers plays a game in which the egotistical conscious self pretends not to know what the whole self definitely does know. Since the ego is definitely a part of the whole self, then it must necessarily be basically aware of such knowledge. In its intense focus in physical reality, however, it pretends not to know until it feels able to utilize information in physical terms. You do have access to the inner self, therefore. You are hardly cut off from your own soul or entity. The ego prefers to consider itself the captain at the helm, so to speak, since it is the ego who most directly deals with the sometimes tumultuous seas of physical reality. And it does not want to be distracted from this task. Channels, psychological, and psychic always exist, sending communication back and forth through the various levels of the self. And the ego accepts necessary information and data from inner portions of the personality without question. Its position, in fact, depends in a large manner upon this unquestioning acceptance of inner data. The ego in other words, the exterior self that you think of as yourself, that portion of you maintains its safety and its seeming command precisely because inner layers of your own personality constantly uphold it, keep the physical body operating, and maintain communications with the multitudinous stimuli that come from both outside conditions and inside conditions. The soul or entity is not diminished, but expanded through reincarnations, through existence and experience and probable realities, something that I will explain later. It is only because you have a highly limited conception of your own entity that you insist upon it being almost sterile in its singularity. There are millions of cells within your body, but you call your body a unit and consider it your own. You do form it from the inside out, and yet you form it from living substance, and each smallest particle has its own living consciousness. 
there are clumps of matter, and in that respect, there are clumps of consciousness, each individual with their own destiny and abilities and potentials. There are no limitations to your own entity. Therefore, how can your entity or soul have boundaries? For boundaries would enclose it and deny it freedom. Let's talk about it. This passage is discussing the nature of the soul or entity and how it differs from the way it's often perceived. First off, a soul is not something that you, that we possess. It's what we are. It's literally what we are. The material emphasizes that the soul or entity is not a separate possession or some sort of external thing, but rather an integral part of your being. It's not like an object you can have or lose. Instead, it constitutes your innermost identity. The term entity is used to avoid religious connotations. Seth prefers using the term entity instead of soul to avoid misconceptions associated with the latter, especially those of religious and organizational nature. The soul. The soul is not a fixed, unchanging thing. You see, many people view the soul as a static and unchangeable entity like a cherished heirloom. However, the material argues that the soul is alive. It's responsive, constantly evolving. The soul's existence is not tied to three-dimensional reality. But in physical reality, we often perceive development as reaching a destination or achieving something. The difference is the soul's growth is not constrained by time. It's not constrained by space. It exists in other dimensions where fulfillment does not rely on reaching specific points. The ego. The ego and the whole self. The passage highlights the relationship between the ego and the whole self. The ego, our conscious self, sometimes pretends not to know what the whole self, which includes the soul, knows. However, the ego does have access to this knowledge, and the two parts of the self communicate through various channels. The soul is not limited or confined. That's very important. The passage suggests that the soul is not limited by boundaries as it is continuously expanding through experiences and existences in various realities. Just as the body consists of numerous cells, each with its own consciousness, the soul is not singular but composed of various facets and potentials. In essence, the passage challenges the idea of the soul as a fixed, isolated entity and instead presents, presents it as an ever-changing and interconnected part of one's being. It encourages a broader perspective on the soul's nature and emphasizes its boundless potential for growth and development. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a share, hitting the like button, and of course, subscribing for more. What did you think of my assessment of this material? If you have anything else to add, please add it down below in the comments. Thank you.